Let's look at the strain parameters in some ideal deformation situations. Consider that there is a cuboid of this side having length A, this side having length B and this side having a length C. Now suppose the deformation is made and this cuboid alters to another cuboid. So that this length becomes A dash, this length becomes B dash and this length becomes C dash. So we are looking at these measurements at three perpendicular directions and due to deformation this change has happened. What can be a geological situation where such a thing as can happen? Imagine we have got a material and we have hammered at the top very ideally then from here to there transformation is possible. Now we want to find out in this case along the three perpendicular directions and then the three perpendicular directions what is the relationship amongst let us say stretch S. So, here we see along this direction let us say I call it capital A direction A length has become A dash. So, the stretch along axis A is given by the final length A dash divided by A a dash final length divided by the initial length and this direction let us say we call it the B direction here the stretch is given by B dash by B and if I take the third direction here and call this as the capital C direction then the stretch this is capital C is given by C dash divided by C. So now note that along A as per the diagram the length has increased whereas B has increased and C has decreased to C dash. What I mean here is that B dash has increased and C is more than C dash. So although I am using the word stretch along A I understand the length has increased actually along the C direction capital C direction the length is actually reduced so shortening has taken place. Now out of curiosity if I multiply these three strain parameters S A multiplied by S B multiplied by S C turns out to be A dash B dash C dash is the volume of this cuboid and ABC is the volume of this cuboid. So I can write in this manner also V is the initial volume and V dash is the final volume. Now consider that there is no dilation or no volume change involved. So I can write if V dash is equal to V suppose in that case their product will be equal to 1. So this is a relationship among the strain parameters when no volume change has taken place. Now assume that in such a deformation there is a volume change. Consider x percent volume change has happened.
due to this deformation. In that case, what is the relationship if I multiply SA, SB and SC, how the product will look like? It will be a function of x in that case. Notice that this problem can be broken into two possibilities. Number one, there can be x percent volume increase or x percent volume decrease. So there are two possibilities. Possibility one is that x percent volume increase or x percent volume decrease. We can take these two cases and see how SA, SB and SC if multiplied will be a function of x in that case. Let us choose this one. x percent volume increase means what? If initially the volume was x that means after the deformation the volume will be Now, what was the initial volume in this case? This is our initial condition I and this is the final condition F. Initially, the volume was ABC. So, the final volume will be 100 plus X multiplied by ABC divided by 100. So, this is the final volume. And what is the other way of finding the final volume? The final volume is given by A dash, B dash, C dash because it is the product of the three perpendicular directions and how much is the length. So from here I can say A dash, B dash, C dash has to be equal to this. So I can write therefore a dash b dash c dash is equal to 100 plus x multiplied by a b c divided by 100. So, from here we can write a dash by a multiplied by b dash by b multiplied by c dash by c is equal to. So, what I have done a dash by a multiplied by b dash by b multiplied by c dash by c is equal to rest of the terms. So, which is 1 plus x by 100. Now, we know that what is capital SA, what is capital SB and what is capital SC. So, if I replace these values there, I get SA multiplied by SB multiplied by SC is equal to 1 plus x by 100. So, this is the relationship. Now, if instead of thinking that there is x percent increase in volume, I think there is x percent decrease in volume. So, in that case similar process will work. What will be the change happening? What was initially 100 unit volume after deformation has become 100 minus x. So, therefore, if there is a ABC volume, this becomes 100 minus x multiplied by ABC divided by 100. And now, this I will equate with A dash, B dash and C dash. So, now following the similar process, I can write down in that case, S A multiplied by S B multiplied by S C is given by 1 minus x by 100. So, these are the two relations and you can see if x equal to 0 that means no volume increase or no volume decrease then what happens S A multiplied by S B multiplied by S C equal to 1 same relationship also comes from there. Now, with this background we want to see what we did right now is volume balancing, what will happen if area balancing is done and what kind of relationship in strain parameters can be established. 
So here the diagram will remain the same, this part I will erase. Now I will consider here only this plane. So what is this plane? We can call this plane as the AC plane. Why? Because the A axis is here which is there, this is the C axis. A plane containing A and C axis is called AC plane before deformation and the AC capital A capital C plane after deformation. Now here since I am con uh, considering in two dimension, I will be considering SA and SC, SB will not be considered. So here I can write as per the diagrams, these two diagrams SA is equal to A dash divided by A and SC equal to C dash divided by C. This C is capital C, these are the small c's, the lens initial and the final. Now if I multiply these two, SA multiplied by SC is equal to A dash C dash divided by AC. Okay. Now here we say that if there is no change in area during the deformation, which is not the case in my diagram, I can clearly see that some, probably some area changes happen, probably. Suppose the area remains the same, suppose it is a constant area deformation, what does that mean? That means A dash C dash is equal to AC, then what it means is that SA, SC is equal to 1 they are equal so they get cancelled out. What we did for the AC plane, it can also be done for the AB plane and also for the BC plane if the areas are the same. Now one thing I can see clearly in the diagram, suppose there is a volume change has not taken place, nevertheless area changes might happen in some of these AB planes, BC, AB, BC or AC planes that might be possible you can cross check whether it is true or false. So the previous relationship just recollecting we say SA multiplied by SB multiplied by SC is equal to 1 whereas in case of two dimensional case SA multiplied by SC equal to 1 when there is no area change. Suppose I say there is x percent area increase or y percent area decrease during such deformation you can also again establish the relationship of stretches if you multiply stretch A and stretch C in two perpendicular directions. How? what would be the relation in terms of x and y. Now having said this, we are going to see how an ellipsoid deforms to another ellipsoid and whether or what kind of relationship we find out amongst SA, SB and SC. So instead of this, we are going to look at the deformation of ellipsoid, take this ellipsoid. This is our ellipsoid initial and after deformation we get ellipsoid of a different geometry. So here we will again define the directions. So this is my capital C direction, this is my capital A direction and this is my capital B direction, the three orthogonal directions. Now imagine that the length of the axis of the ellipsoid along the direction A that means this one. So I am talking about the length PQ is equal to the length of the axis along the direction A and after deformation I can write represent PQ as P dash Q dash. So here P dash Q dash is equal to the length of the ellipsoid 
along direction A. This is for the initial condition and this is for the final condition. Now, how much is the stretch along direction A we want to find out? S A stretch along direction A is given by the final length divided by the initial length. So, it is I can write L A F divided by L A initial and if we can also write like this P dash Q dash divided by P Q. Okay. Now, I can write S B and S C in the other two directions. S capital B will be given by length along B final divided by length along B initial. And now, if we look at the product of the three stretches along the three perpendicular directions, then we can write down this, this and this expression. From here, what we can do? I can multiply here fourth third, and I can also multiply here fourth third. Further, I can divide each length by two in all cases. That means this one divided by two, this one divided by two, and this one divided by two. That means divided by eight. And here also I do this one divided by 2, this one divided by 2 and this one divided by 2 divided by 8. So, as you see I have given the same thing at the numerator and the denominator. So, basically which means they get cancelled out. So, therefore, the ratio is maintained. Now, we look at the formula of the volume of ellipsoid. Just recollect volume of ellipsoid is given by 4 third pi a b and c. What is a? It is a half of one of the axis length. This is half of another axis length and this is half of another axis length. So, if you want to derive the volume of sphere from ellipsoid for example, just to give an example. volume of sphere, if you want to find the volume of sphere from this volume of ellipsoid A equal to B equal to C. So, therefore, that becomes equal to 4 third pi r cube where r is equal to A equal to B equal to C. So, we are going to see this formula over there. In this multiplication what has happened? This gives you the volume of the ellipsoid in the final condition note the subscript f in all the cases and the in the denominator i in all the cases. Therefore, this gives us the formula of the volume of the ellipsoid in the initial condition. So, from here I can write this is equal to volume of the final, final volume of the ellipsoid divided by the initial volume of the ellipsoid. Now, if we consider that there is no volume change in this deformation then that would mean and this product just like what we saw for the cuboids same relation is coming that the product will be equal to 1. So, I can write here if V f is equal to V i then S a multi S a multiplied by S b multiplied by S c equal to 1 if there is x percent volume decrease or y percent volume increase also, we can find S A multiplied by S B multiplied by S C equal to a function of x or a function of y in the same way we did for the cuboid. So, now having finished this part, we want to see let us say area wise are we getting similar relationship with 
what we saw in case of cuboid i would request these viewers to stop the video here try to solve it should not be very difficult and after that you see the video once again initiate it and have a look whether you are able to give right answer i hope you have paused the video and you have tried to solve now here is the solution so let's consider the ab plane so where is the ab plane this is the ab plane so on the ab plane consider that this blue line shaded region is basically this blue line is indicating an ellipse say this is an which can also be a circular one but let's consider a more generalized case more general case that it is an ellipse and after deformation the ab plane also becomes another ellipse so what i mean is that there is an ellipse in the initial condition that deforms to another ellipse in the final situation what is the relationship between stretch in these two directions so here we consider this as our direction a and this direction is our direction b say this length is equal to la in the initial condition and this length is equal to l final sorry la in the final condition and what is this length this is lb in the initial condition and this length is lb in the final condition now let's take the area of the ellipse in the initial condition in an undeformed state the area of the ellipse before deformation a is given by pi multiplied by the semi major axis multiplied by the semi minor axis which is given by l a i multiplied by l b i and what is the area of the ellipse in the final situation a final area is equal to pi multiplied by l a final multiplied by l b final now if the two areas are same suppose in certain deformation say ai equal to af then what does that mean these two are equal i forgot to mention here divided by 4 and here divided by 4 because lai divided by 2 is a semi major axis lbi divided by 2 is a semi minor axis so if ai is equal to af this will lead to la initial multiplied by lb initial is equal to la final multiplied by lb final so from here we can write that la final divided by l a initial multiplied by l b final divided by l b initial is equal to 1 now this is basically s a and this is basically s b and their product becomes equal to 1 so the stretch in two directions if i consider one ellipse deforming to another ellipse and if there is no area change then the stretch in those two directions product will be equal to 1 similar to what we have seen with a rectangular area 
So here we consider one ellipse deforming into another ellipse and so it can be a circle deforming into an ellipse because a circle is a special kind of an ellipse. So this relationship will hold true or an ellipse deforming into a circle then this relationship will hold true. We have seen previously in this lecture that one ellipsoid deforms to another ellipsoid and the relationship among these stretch in three perpendicular directions. Suppose in that case we say a sphere deforms to an ellipsoid the same relationship the same kind of logic will work or if we think that there is an ellipsoid that deforms to a sphere then also same logic will work. So with this we can now look into the more geologically realistic deformations and using cross section balancing we will try to find out these strain parameters. Imagine I am looking at a folded layer and I have just drawn a single line. We know that the folds are produced usually by compression and uh, usually the post depositional layers are straight. So in cross section it is a straight line whereas now I see a folded layer. Suppose it is produced by a tectonic deformation that it is not this curvature is not produced by depositional issues. It is produced by deformation the amount of shortening SH which I have already defined in a previous lecture. How to do it? Consider this point is A, this point is B, find out the AB curve line length. How to do that in the classroom? Uh, you have to you can take a scale and break this AB line into small segments of straight lines and keep measuring. So in that way you can find out the approximate length AB. There is another way of doing take a thread and superpose the thread exactly like this curved AB line. After that stretch the thread make it straight and find out the total length. So this length is our initial length it is the length initial. What is the distance right now between the points A and B the straight line distance. So for that you can jo join this line and this AB length straight length is the length final. Naturally we can see that length final is less than length initial therefore it indicates a shortening. Now once Li and Lf are known we can use the formula shortening is equal to the change in length divided by the initial length. We can also put a negative minus symbol indicating shortening. So how much is the change in length? This will be equal to the final length, length final minus length initial divided by length initial. And using this and this over there we can write this is equal to the AB straight line distance minus the AB curve distance divided by the AB curve line distance. And as we see uh, this is the relationship so therefore it is going to be a negative number indicating shortening. Once shortening is obtained for this fold we can find out shortening percentage by multiplying shortening with 100 and expressing it as a percent. So it is very simple. So here the line length balance has been followed. We have assumed that before deformation and after deformation the line length has not changed. But if we are doing research in detail even this has to be established before applying straight away the formula. What is the proof in field that the line length before and after deformation has not changed? That has to be thought about. Now I am going to talk about the strain parameter calculation from folds not based on the line length balance but rather area balance. Let us have a look. So in case of this area balance case we will not consider fold just as a line rather I will consider two lines. Imagine this is a folded layer. So in this fold I can call this line over here as extra dos and this line can be called as an intra dos and this portion I can say as the core of the fold.
Okay. Now, as per my sketch, and it is true that a folded layer will not be folded for infinite distance. Suppose this is the case in the field, how do I find out the strain parameter from here? So, the approach is that find out the place where the layer is not folded, for example, here and here it is not folded, and where the folded layer alters to unfolded layer or straight layer, think of a pin line. What is a pin line? It is an imaginary line which will demarcate my area of consideration for the strain analysis. The second pin line I can set over here. As I see this portion is folded, that portion layers are not folded. So, these two pin lines which are imaginary lines within this I am going to take care of my calculation. It can be commonly be observed that a folded layer, if I trace it along the fold, I will find a place where the layer is not folded and almost uniform thickness can be seen here and here as per my diagram have has the nearly equal thickness. Assume that this thickness is small d. Very reasonably we can say that before the deformation happened, small d was the distance was the thickness of the layer throughout even here, here, here also and due to folding irregularity has developed and the thickness has altered. So, now I will create a mental model what is that I will think of a rectangular piece of material of same thickness d and I will think the two pin lines here, these two pin lines are here, this is the final what we observe in the field and this is the initial nowhere seen actually it is in my mind so I am calling it a mental model. Okay. And let us say this distance is A. So, before deformation the area of this rectangle is the area before deformation the rectangle area is a d. Now, here we need to find out the area bound by the extra dos and intra dos and bound by the two pin lines. How much is this area? So, I have already made a short video on finding out the area in such a case. I will tell you the summary over here. The summary is that I will draw a line like this, call it let us say point A, call it point B and then by the method equidistant lines which are orthogonal on the AB, I have to find out this area first bound by AB and then this bottom portion, this bottom curve over here, this area subtract bigger area minus smaller area and I can get that area. Suppose that area comes out to be A final, A final is the area. Now, I can say suppose it is a constant area deformation, then what will happen? A final sorry A initial will be, will be equal to the A final. So, if we do so we can write A D what is A D I have defined here A D is equal to now from here A F the area you have calculated already and the D length you have found from the final figure much away from the fold you know this d. So, from here you can find out the distance a which is a f f as a subscript divided by d and what is a as per my diagram the distance between the two pin lines before deformation. So, here we can say that a is equal to the length initial and what is the length final? the distance between these two pin lines right now is the length final. 
So, L initial is known, L final is known and of course as we can see from the diagram, L initial is more than the L final. That compression has happened, fold is produced. So, L i is more than L f. Then apply the formula of shortening. Shortening is given by S h, the change in length divided by original length. What is change in length? Final length minus initial length which is L f minus L i divided by L i. And as we see this is the relationship, L i is bigger it is coming out to be a negative number. So, in this way shortening is found out. If I multiply shortening by 100, I will get the percent sh shortening. So, in this way we can find out the strain parameter applying the cross section balancing principle from the geological structure such as folds. Now, my question comes, we can apply this area balance and we can find out this the strain parameter shortening. And we can also apply the line, line length balance method like this is the length of the line before deformation and final length is also seen right now the AB distance. Will we get same shortening result if area balance is applied and if the line length balance is applied? If they are not matching then this becomes a matter of serious concern which one should I consider in the geological case. So, I am writing the question please think about it. Suppose, if it is so then there is no problem, but if they are not equal, which one should I take SH1 or SH2? Another doubt comes to our mind, when should we apply the area balance method? Now, this can be addressed in the field. If we find that the rock has undergone metamorphism, diagenesis or later igneous intrusion has cut across the fold, that means volume disturbance has taken place which can indicate that there might be change in area. So, in that case this process will not work and suppose a geologist is able to tell that in a folded terrain there has been say 14 percent area increase, but the question is how will you find out? Suppose you find out, can you find out the strain parameter? The answer is yes. If we know the percentage of area increase or decrease in the process of deformation, then we will be able to also find out the strain parameter in that case. But then the question is how do I know that? How much percent of area change has happened in the uh, geological structure? Let us see few other examples how to deal with folds and to come up with the strain parameters. Take an example, say this is a rigid block that does not undergo deformation easily. What is this? a rigid block and over this there is deformable material. Maybe this is the basement hard rock and then there is sediment deposition at the top. So, this is I am considering to be a deformable material. Okay. Further assumptions consider that here this boundary is also rigid. How can we think about it? Imagine there is a piece of wood and over that I have kept a cake and both are touched with this wall. So, this wall is rigid, the board is rigid, the wood is rigid, but the soft cake, soft clay polydimethysiloxane, bouncing putty, silicon putty, whatever we think any soft deformable material even chocolate can also be thought we take as the model material. So, in such situation I apply compression here and there. So, we consider the compression is not very high so that this rigid material remains as rigid, but if it is very high rigid material can also break, the piece of wood can also break, this material remains intact but naturally this soft material is going to get folded. After this compression due to that effect the layer gets folded. So, if I think of this line as P Q then after deformation here is point P dash here is point Q dash. 
So the question is how much shortening has happened SH that parameter we want to find out. Now here if we apply the area balance method we can tell you that this area gain due to folding is equal to the area loss that has happened over here. Okay. So how much is this area gain due to folding? I have already discussed in such situations how to find out the area. Basically you have to drop lines which are equidistant and all are orthogonal on this line like this and then applying the formula find out this area. Suppose this area is A final then this area final is equal to this rectangular area which is given P dash P this length multiplied by the PQ length. Now from this construction we can find out the PQ length as per the given diagram we can find out the PQ length. So PQ is known, AF is known, P dash P can be worked out. If P dash P is worked out that means this distance is known. So from the given geometry of the fold which is like this, these are all the given information I am able to tell that this folded layer, this typically ideally folded layer before folding was of this geometry. Again it is a mental model we are thinking most logically this is true that this area is was actually this area. So once we have found out the P dash P this is the change in length along x direction. So this P dash P is basically my change in length delta L. And what was the initial length in my consideration here? This was a rigid wall so I can consider this point and this point this is my initial distance. So L initial. So how do I find out L initial? We already have this distance known from the given fold geometry we know this distance. With this known distance I add up basically delta L. Once I add up delta L I know the L initial also. So therefore in this case the shortening is given by minus delta L divided by L initial 